Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today we're talking about assessments. You will see assessments on most teacher certification exams, specifically the subject area exams, and we're gonna break down the main types of assessments you will see so you'll be able to navigate them on exam day. Let's get started. So many of you are taking your teacher certification exams and you will definitely see questions about assessments on all subject area certification exams for teachers. The reason being is that the Board of Education wants to make sure that you understand how to use assessments to make decisions in the classroom. And so it's important for you to understand the main assessments you will see on your exams. Now this is specifically for test day. Obviously we use assessments in all different ways in the classroom and for our students, but on exam day you're going to see them used in a particular way. So let's hop over to my presentation so I can show you a little bit about assessments. Remember when we're talking about assessments we're talking about being data driven. That is the reason we use assessments. Assessments should not be used just to put a grade in the grade book or to appease you know, a parent because they want you know, a report card or something like that. Assessments are really used so that you as the teacher can make informed decisions about what the students need. And that's why we use assessments, okay? So always remember that. I know that we do spelling tests at the end of the week to put a grade in the grade book and so students can go home and say, I got an A and things like that. But really, they're supposed to be used to measure student progress and so you can intervene if you need to or challenge a student more if need be. Um, and so those decisions are very important. So one thing I like to do when I'm talking about assessments is to break it down in this table here. You will see this table in a lot of our study guides. Pretty much every single subject area exam is going to assess assessments. So every single one of our subject area exam study guides has this table or a table similar in it. And so over here on this left-hand column here, we have the test type. These are the main test types you will see on test day. Then we have their attributes and kind of what makes them what they are. And then I have examples here. So I'm just going to go through them one by one so you have a better understanding of these assessments. All right, the first type of assessment is the screening. Now, screening usually happens at the beginning of the year or if a student enters the school. A screening is when you are giving them an overarching assessment and you're measuring their overarching skills. And you're using those measures or those outcomes to place the student somewhere. For example, if a student comes in from another state and you have no idea, the records haven't come with the student, you have no idea you know, what the student's reading level is, what the student's you know, skills are, you might do a screening or the reading coach might do a screening to figure out where to place the student. And so maybe the student's off the charts, like reading crazy high, that student might be placed in honors or something like that. Or if the student is having difficulty, that student might be placed in some of the more interventions classes where the student can receive some support. So that's what screening is. I use this example here, the CELSA. That is a screening test used at all levels, but particularly at the college level for English learners who are entering college. So for example, at the university, you might be given the CELSA to see where you are in terms of your English skills. And if you need support in those areas, they may you know, put you in some other classes there. So that's a screening type test. It's an overarching exam where we place students. The next type of assessment is called a diagnostic assessment. It's similar to like when a doctor diagnoses you and tries to figure out what's going on. The same thing with teachers. This is used to pinpoint any specific things. So for example, if you came in, let's say I was a reading teacher and you were screened, right? And they said, okay, this student is reading at a level two, we're gonna put them in your classroom, okay? Well, that shows that the student's reading at a level two, but it doesn't really show what the student specifically needs. For example, does the student need help in phonemic awareness or phonics? Does the student need more support in morphology? If it's math, does the student need support in math facts, addition, subtraction, grouping, regrouping? So the diagnostic helps to pinpoint exactly what's going on and really gives the teacher 
a lot of information so that the teacher can intervene specifically and help those students. And a very common diagnostic exam is what we call DIBBLES. This is for reading. It measures the different skills, foundational skills in reading. It'll measure phonemic awareness and phonics and morphology and things like that. Some will argue that DIBBLES is actually a screening test. And in real life, a lot of these exams kind of overlap and are used you know, interchangeably, but on the test, typically a diagnostic is used to diagnose and a screening is used to place. But Dibbles is an example of a diagnostic because you can pinpoint what skills exactly the student needs. And there's all kinds of diagnostic tests. You can do them in math to figure out what math skills. You can diagnose in social studies, in PE. You can figure out which skills physically the student is lacking. So diagnostics are very powerful tools for teachers. Then we move to what we call the formative assessments. And formatives are used to inform instruction. Now, formatives are typically informal, ongoing assessments. So these are constantly happening throughout the day, throughout the lesson. This is where the teacher is observing. She might be using checklists. He or she might be using writing examples to kind of see what's going on. This is what you do every day in the classroom and you're making decisions on the fly. So for example, you might use a formative assessment to group students that day. You might be using flexible grouping based on skills. So you might be walking around the room and observing that this student is actually getting the skill very quickly. You might pull that student out of that group and put her over here in a more advanced group temporarily. And you're moving kids in and out of groups based on your formative assessment or your observation. So those are very powerful. Um, remember, when we, when we talk about formative assessments, we typically are talking about ongoing and informal. So if you see those words on the assessment that you take for the teacher certification exams, you're gonna think formative assessment. Now, summative assessments, you'll definitely see on the exam. Summative assessments measure outcomes. So what happens at the end? You would use a summative assessment at the end of a chapter, a unit, or even a semester to see if students did you know, achieve on the standards that you were um, teaching in the unit or lesson or whatever. Summative, think sum, and that happens at the end of learning. Now, can a summative be turned into a formative? Certainly. Let's say you give a chapter test at the end of the chapter, you think you're done as a teacher, and you get the chapter test back and you see the kids have bombed it in a certain area. This has happened to me before I taught science. Um, I kind of breezed over a section in cells, the diffusion section, because I just thought everybody understood it. And when I did the chapter test, I saw that most of my students did not understand diffusion. So that summative, that chapter test turned into a formative for me because then I went back and I retaught diffusion. So that kind of, you know, informed my decision making. We actually went back. But typically on the teacher certification exam, summatives happen at the end, they measure outcomes. You might use a summative to measure a, um, a strategy or a program that you're using. Let's say you are using a new reading program and you take a pretest, which often a pretest is a diagnostic test to see where kids are, right? So you do a pretest. Where are the students right now with these skills? You teach a little bit, you do some activities and all of that. And then you do a post test or a summative at the end to measure what's going on and to measure to see if they achieved. So summatives typically happen at the end. These are unit tests, chapter tests, anything that happens at the end of learning, okay? Then we have criterion referenced exams. And these are the state standardized tests. Standards are the criteria by which your students are assessed. So you can see that there is a predetermined criteria in which students are measured against. So for example, your state and reading math exams, those are going to be criterion reference. Your teacher certification exams are criterion reference because they are built based on teaching standards for one, and also your state academic standards. So for example, if you're taking the high school math teacher certification exams. Those exams are built against the state standards for math at those grade levels from seven through 12 or whatever. So they are criterion referenced exams. And typically these happen at the end of the year for students, sometimes in April and May 
for you, they're happening all the time. You're taking lots of different teacher certification exams, but just think criteria and reference are measured against the standards, standards-based assessments, all right? And then that brings us to the last one we're gonna talk about today is the norm referenced exams. Norm reference measure the norm, or what I like to call that bell curve. Norm referenced exams compare students against other students, or schools against other schools, or districts against other districts, or even countries against other countries. Usually they are expressed in a percentile ranking, so if I say something like this, you're in the 90th percentile, that means you scored at or above 90% of the people who took the exam. So that's good. You're at the top. If I say you're in the 20th percentile, that means you're down at the bottom. You only scored at or above 20% of the people who took the exam. Now, here's the trick. You might be in the 90th percentile according to this group of students over here. But if I measured you against these groups of students over here, they might have done much better and you might drop in terms of your percentile ranking. So it's really about how you are performing against other students. Yes, you are taking the exam, but the score is um, determined on a bell curve. And so it's really um, determinant of how others are scoring on that exam. And a quick example of that are the PISA exams. The PISA exams are administered in every country all over the world, and then each country is given a percentile ranking. So for example, you'll see it come out every year. China and Japan are beating the United States. Finland is beating the United States based on PISA scores. And so you will see that our percentile ranking there. Um, one of the things you might see in whatever state you're, you're in, you might do your state criterion reference test, which is your you know, reading and math assessments for that year. And then possibly the next day, you might do something called the NRTs or the norm reference test. Sometimes those come after the criterion referenced exams so that the state can measure students against other students in different districts and different schools. So sometimes you'll have the NRTs after the main criterion referenced exams. I know that's how it was in Florida for a long time. We would have our state assessment, the FCAT, but it's not the FCAT anymore, it's called something else. And then after FCAT day was the NRT day, so that the FCAT day was um, the actual criterion referenced and the NRT day was the norm reference test, NRT, norm reference test. So you might have those in your state as well. Remember, the, um, the states, are in charge of education. Education is left to the states. So while there are some federal mandates and even some tests at the national level when we talk about PISA, typically criterion referenced exams and norm referenced exams are left to the states. So every state has a different type of criterion referenced exam. Now, let's just go over one way in which you might use these assessments in a very um, impactful way for your students. So for example, let's say students come in, here's number one, they get screened. Um, they're in your class for whatever reason, whether you're an honors teacher or maybe you're a support teacher or whatever, they're being screened, they're put into your class. Then before lessons, before you do anything in terms of working with students, you might do a diagnostic for all your students to measure their specific skills in any one of these areas. This can also be called a pretest. Maybe you're starting a unit on evolution in science and you wanna figure out where your kids are in terms of their understanding of it. Or maybe you're starting the year off and you really wanna understand where your kids are with their math skills or their reading skills. So you give a test that really measures those so you can figure out who's got what and who you're going to help and how you're going to help them. Then while you administer your lessons and you decide who's going to get what lesson and how you're going to intervene, you are consistently using formative assessments to um, measure students' skills, to move students in and out of groups. You're observing, you're watching, you're doing little mini quizzes, and you are making decisions constantly throughout the month week, day, year, in order to meet the needs of every student. 
Then periodically at the end of units, at the end of chapters, you are going to use those summative assessments. And if you see any kind of glaring issues, you may go back and reteach. But those summative assessments typically go as grades in the gradebook, and you're using them for yourself to see if your strategies worked. Remember, if you did a diagnostic or a pretest in the beginning, and then you use some sort of program or strategies, you formatively assessed along the way, and it looked like your kids were doing okay. And then you give a summative and they all tank. Well, you as a teacher have to go back and figure out, you know, what you're going to do in order to fix that, right? So summatives are powerful tools as well. And remember those measure those outcomes. Finally, at the end of the year, your students are getting that criterion reference test, which everybody dreads, and that's really administered by the state and then the state makes decisions based on that. Your evaluations are usually tied to those scores. Um, there's a lot of debate regarding criterion referenced exams. I have my own opinion on them. Um, we won't get into that in this video, but uh, they are used at the end of the year to measure teachers success, student success, and overall school success. And then finally, the norm referenced exams, you're gonna see these throughout. AP exams are considered norm referenced exams. The PISA, the NRTs, those are just gonna be administered throughout the, um, the year or even at the end of the year, depending on what state you're in. You typically won't use a lot of norm reference tests. Um, sometimes in reading, like we have the STAR test, and that will give you a norm reference percentile ranking at the bottom, which is somewhat helpful, but really the STAR test also can be used as a diagnostic or even a formative to figure out where your kids are. So remember, in the real world, those tests intermingle and we're kind of like using them for different reasons. But on test day for your teacher certification exams, you want to keep this table in mind. All right, so that's it for our assessment overview. Make sure you keep this in mind when you're working for your teacher certification exams. Thank you so much for watching. That concludes our assessments overview for the day. Please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, giving this video a thumbs up, and if you have any questions, throw them in the comments below. Thank you so much and have an awesome day. Thank you so much for watching. We have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel. Please consider subscribing and following me on my social media networks at Kathleen Jasper. Have a great day.